What is up ladies and gents and welcome to the long awaited holy guide. Today I'm going to be going over the basics of what you need to know to play holy priest in arena. And it's going to follow a similar format to the disc guide we did uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and I'm going to start by talking about preparations that you can make for your character outside of arena. And this is going to make you just stronger in general inside of arena and is a good starting point I think for the guide. So I'm going to talk about race, gear, legendaries, uh, and then gems and enchants. And then we're going to follow up with covenants, soul binds, and conduits. And then once we've gone through all that, then I'm going to give you some kind of info on what PvP talents and, and talents to run. Uh, there's not a lot of, of chopping and changing for holy, so that's good news. And then I'm going to talk about some potential comps that, you know, I think are fun that you can run as holy, that sort of thing that I think you're going to have success with. And then I'm going to finish up by just going over some general general healing tips, general gameplay tips for Holy, Holy specifically, that is going to, you know, is going to be useful for you guys, some, some information that's going to be useful for you guys, and, and hopefully you can try and adopt to try and improve your gameplay. So without further ado, let's get into race. So I want to keep this really simple. For Alliance, if you're focused on 3v3, you should be going Night Off, as Trinket is very important at the moment with the game being more bursty. In 2v2, if you're more focused for, focused on 2v2, then you can actually get away with playing Human with the Relentless Trinket, as uh, regular Trinket is not going to be as important for you. For Horde, you want to be just sticking with Undead. I think that Undead is generally the strongest... Uh, and most solid race you can play on Horde right now, just because of how many priests there are, how many warriors there are. You know, Warlocks are creeping up as well. Fear is very strong. So I think that Undead just has more value in most comps than any other race. So the stat priority for Holy is relatively simple. We're going to prioritize Versa over Haste over everything else. The reason we prior Versa is because of the 40% bonus we get from Trinkets. Haste is really good because it allows us to farm back Holy Words quicker. We're going to be getting more spells off in between the Holy Words. So this is going to mean that they're up more often. And that's going to keep us safer and allow us to do goes more often. Uh, it's also reducing the cooldown of Prayer Amending by a small amount. And this is not going to be immediately obvious. But it's going to be maybe an, an extra Prayer Amending over you know the course of a whole game. So it's, it's a small increase, but it's an increase no, nonetheless. Mastery is nice because it adds more passive healing. So essentially what Mastery does is when you cast a heal, you get a hot. And this hot increases based on how much mastery that you have. It's an increased percentage of the initial heal. This actually doesn't scale that quickly. So stacking a lot of mastery doesn't actually show that much uh, immediate benefit. And so that's why in my current build, I don't have that much mastery. I'm stacking really a lot of haste, and a lot of it's coming from this trinket as well. Keep in mind that you will be rotating this around with BM trinket, depending on what you're facing. Uh, but yeah, at the moment I'm probably on overkill on haste, just trying it out. Most likely I'm going to end up taking more Versa instead. But we will, we will see. I think there's probably some kind of hybrid of haste, mastery, and Versa that is ideal. Uh, final notes are on crit, I guess. Essentially, you're starting with around 5 to 6% crit, depending on your race. And you can actually almost double this. You can get to like uh, around 10%, I think, with like three different items, uh, potentially, that have crit on. And this is essentially going to double the number of death crits that you get, double the number of mind games crits you get, that sort of thing. And these things can really actually swing a game. If you get a death crit, you might just kill someone be because of it. Uh, whereas you you know you you would usually maybe get them to five percent or something and then they have time to react and maybe survive. So a death crit is very impactful on the game. So I would say that crit is somewhat undervalued at the moment uh, with regards to that because it's really hard to measure that potential versus something like mastery where you're not seeing the immediate kind of benefit of mastery where you're like yeah man that mastery won me the game if that makes sense. So that's the, that's the reason crit potentially has some value we're going to see in the future with that. Uh, stay tuned on that one. I think we haven't got to the bottom of the uh, the holy stat priority just yet. 
But for now, I would say go for a good amount of Versa and a good amount of Haste, and it's going to feel decent for you until you feel comfortable to start making changes. Gems and enchants are more of the same uh, compared to disc, really. It's essentially right now I'm gemming Haste. You can gem Haste or you can gem Versa. Either is fine. Right now I'm trying to go for a little bit more Haste, but I think if you want to be a little bit, little bit safer uh, and, and, you know, play a longer game, have your spells be a little bit more impactful, then gemming Versa is completely fine as well. Obviously, enchants, you still want the minor speed increase on Cloak. It's going to be very, very valuable for you for when you're pushing for Fizz. Chest, we're going to still go for the 6% mana, just because uh, there is potential still to go Oom. If you feel like you're not going Oom at all, you can go for the 30 all stats. Give it a try. On Braces, we're going to stick with the 15 Intellect. Nothing special there. Weapon, Celestial Guidance, the usual. Uh, and then Rings, again, you can enchant Haste or Versa. That one is completely personal preference. And then I would say the last thing to note is you can actually run this gem. So for legendaries, I say it's generally considered that the best holy legendary at the moment is Harmonious Apparatus. And this is really solid in 3v3 where it's generally harder to get casts off. You know, a larger percentage of your reset is going to come from Holy Fire and Mending since you're not going to be getting off as many smites and heals. So this is going to be really, really high value in terms of reset value for you. And generally, I would say, is going to be your legendary of choice. Now, there's going to be a few other situations where you might want to choose something different. But if this is going to be your first legendary and you want to play holy, I would say this is the one to go for. Now, I guess the second or, or maybe joint second most used legendary is going to be Cephas for you. And this is also good if you're playing other specs. Obviously, Cephas has value for both Shadow and for Disc as well. So if you're thinking you don't, not sure which spec to play, you want to play a bit of everything, then I would say go for Cephas. It's going to be decent. Uh, I'd say it's not as strong as Harmonious for Holy, but it's still a really good contender. It's also potentially worth it in 3v3 if there's a, if there's a comp that has really a lot of CC on you and you're feeling you're getting, you know, CC'd a lot of the game, you can potentially switch up to Cephas and try and make value out of that as well. I guess the joint, the other joint uh, second best legendary is going to be the self-grip one, Vault of Heavens. And this is going to be really important for you as Holy against Cleave teams that go on you. If if you're having issues in 2v2 as well, with against, say, Windwalker Monks really training you down, this is going to really, really uh, improve how much you're able to survive and how long you're able to survive for this. You know, you can use it during a fists and, and negate that fists entirely, essentially. Uh, it's another button you can press and it provides you with a snare removal at the end of it. So I would say this is a very important one to have if you're building up your legendary collection and you want to try and push push that bit of extra rating in threes and you're really struggling against cleaves, this is potentially the answer for you. There's also, I guess, value in using it to land fears, although it's not as important as holy as disc because as, disc, uh, as holy you have chastise, or as disc you don't really have anything to fear off. The next legendary that I thought I would touch on is going to be the double PI legendary or Twins of the Sun Priestess. And I would say this has some value in something like RMP where you want to PI, you know, your mage and get some value out of it yourself. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of this one. As you can see, I haven't even collected it yet. And I'd say potentially it has more value as Shadow maybe. As PI, you know, it is a two minute cooldown. And outside of that, you're not really seeing any value from this legendary. I prefer the legendaries that are really, you know, clearly providing that extra PVE value throughout the game. Uh, so I would say... Most likely, in most situations, don't use this. Uh, stick with Harmonious. But I think it's good to know that it exists and, and the benefits of it. Uh, the next is going to be something I'm really not a fan of, which is Zanshi. And this is essentially the self-res legendary. And the reason I don't like this is because it's really easy, easy to counterplay it. If you don't get any healing off, during the Spirit of Redemption, you actually res on 1 HP. Which means that if teams know how it works, they can really capitalize and take advantage of the fact that you, you, know, you have this legendary, which means you're not getting any value throughout the game until you die. 
and then potentially you could still die through it if if team can capitalize on it uh, and you don't have fade or something for example to use after the legendary effect procs and you res uh to heal up safely so yeah not not a big fan of this one again if they don't even, if they don't go on you you don't get any value out of this at all so it's it's quite risky to use potentially you can use this you know, if we're really grasping, you could potentially use it into like a dot cleave. Uh, in late dampening, you could, you know, dispel UAs and force it to proc and then top your team off. Uh, while in Spirit of Redemption and Mana is not an issue. And then come back to life and continue playing the game. You know, that's kind of a really niche case where it could be used. Uh, but I don't think that it's something that, you know, you should really be worrying too much about at this point. I think that you're going to do a lot better and gain a lot more rating and value and wins out of something like Harmonious. Uh, then we have two legendaries remaining that I thought I would touch on and mention. Because I think that potentially with some maybe small patch changes, they could come into play in the future in the meta. The first being Measured Contemplation. Now, my issue with this is the discrete nature of it compared to the BFA counterpart, which was stacking up a lot kind of more continuously now if you heal after 14 seconds you get no value from this legendary if you stack it up after a one whole minute you're going to get a really big flash heal out of it but then it takes a long time to stack up again so it's very uh it's very hard to get value out of this reliably when pvp can be quite unpredictable you don't know exactly when they're going to use their cooldowns that sort of thing and this is going to be of value to you to do a flash heal when there's times of large healing requirement but it may not be up at that time and you can't actually you can't force it in any way right you have to wait for it so then if you're forced to flash heal to keep people alive or to reset you're going to lose your value from this legendary so I think that because of, of you know this this discrete nature, it makes this legendary very hard to reliably get value out of. The other legendary I wanted to talk about is Flash Concentration. And this actually recently got buffed from 15 seconds to 20 seconds. And I think this actually is still not enough. Now there's a couple of things wrong with this legendary. If you don't get Flash Heal procs, then you have to cast a Flash Heal to maintain your stack. This stack may not be, you know, it may not stack up straight away either, right? You need to get five procs before this is going to be at full power. And yes, it's going to be very strong for your heals when it is at full power. And you're going to be doing really big heals, uh, especially if you can combo this with the heal conduit. However, as I said, if you don't get reliable, reliable flash procs with Surge of Light, then you're going to have to cast flash heal, which is really detrimental to your mana. So then that may make this not worth it. So... There's too many conditions for this to be reliable, in my opinion. There's too many There's too many pitfalls where this can break down. Uh, and the second, I guess, also a pitfall, large issue with this is currently it's dispellable. So imagine you, you finally get five stacks up, you're chilling, and then it just gets purged. Okay. Uh, you know, this is a huge issue for this. So I think until this is potentially... Increased to 30 seconds, I believe the 20 seconds can be an issue in PvE as well. I think this needs to get increased to 30 seconds, or it needs to be able to, um, it needs to be able to proc off heal itself, potentially, or or just some other spell other than flash heal. Because right now, it's not reliable enough to get it stacked. And and as as I said, if if it becomes underspellable, then maybe we're going to see this played a little more. And this might be the answer to the sustain healing issues that Holy is having. So next, we're going to talk about Covenants. And I think right now, Venthyr is still the top dog. Night Fae recently got buffed, but I think Venthyr still wins just because of how strong Mind Games is as Holy. Uh, Holy actually hits about 30% harder with all abilities compared to Disc due to the hidden uh, minus damage aura that Disc has for PvE mostly. And this makes mind games super dangerous as a holy priest because it hits really hard and it can crit really, really hard. You know, you can easily get 10k crits. Uh, so because of this, Venthyr is really strong. Obviously, Dora as well is super valuable as any priest spec due to the lack of mobility that we normally have. 
The reason Night Fae is potentially good in some comps is because of the CDR. They also recently buffed the damage reduction. So you can throw one shield out at the start of it on the target they're going on. Usually you don't shield as holy really, but you can throw one shield out and this is going to be 20% damage reduction for the remainder of uh, Fae Guardians, which is really nice. And then obviously the mana returns from it are really good. So you're going to be playing this in more damp matchups potentially. Uh, and, and most likely it's going to be something like Asa Fire, Holy Priest, where you're going to play Night Fae. And yeah, okay, it's it's not uh, ideal to lose out on mind games, but also it's going to allow you to use a flash heal on your mage. And this is going to reduce the cooldown of his combustion significantly. So having an extra combustion in a game just because your Night Fae actually is quite nutty. So definitely a potential there for some some crazy stuff uh, in the current meta. Don't know if anyone has tested it that much yet, but it'll be interesting to see if uh, if more teams start giving this a go, especially in the AWC. With regards to Soulbinds themselves, mostly I'm playing Nadja as Holy because of familiar predicaments. The door fear is not as important as holy because you have chastise to fear out of. So a lot of the time you can actually just move there and do it uh, and then use door defensively. So because of that, agent of chaos is not as detrimental to us, which makes Naja really good because this is probably the best talent in all three of the soul binds. The other option that I sometimes use is Draven. Draven doesn't have that great of a tree, except if people go on you. So against something like, potentially in threes, if you're playing against like Shadow Priest Mage Healer, right? Or Ellie Mage Healer, something like that, that is going to do goes on you, or at least has the potential to do goes on you with Combust, uh, and, and will kill you with Combust if you don't, if you don't count with defensives. Now this is uh, going to allow you to potentially survive these goes, it's not a lot of, of reduced damage taken, but it's something, at least. And it's some extra stamina and extra healing when you get out. Uh, so Draven is generally slightly tankier than the other specs. Uh, the argument also being that, okay, you can reduce the silence duration against the Shadow Priest variant with Nadja. Is this going to make any difference depending on, you know, are you going to get out of the silence or not? If you don't, this is useless. Uh, and maybe the damage reduction is better. So again, this one's to kind of choose for yourself. If you find that you're dying to something, try out Draven. If you're finding that you're able to cast more in general, but you know, kicks are a bit annoying, then familiar predicaments is really valuable. Obviously we want the two potency slots uh, and that I guess draws us on to the conduits. Now, as we go down charitable soul, we don't really shield is useless. Uh, and Translucent Im Image is actually useless for Holy as well because we're going to be playing Greater Fade. Uh, so this essentially renders this useless, right? Because we're not taking damage during Greater Fade anyway. Which leaves us with Light's Inspiration for the Endurance slot as the only option. It's not a bad one, mind you. Uh, and then on Finesse, obviously Clear Mind is really, really strong. But if you're playing with Self Grip, then you're going to want Move with Grace. It's a good shout. Having a one minute cooldown grip. Uh, with two charges for yourself is a lot better than having a woman at 30. Mental recovery has merit for sure, but I think that as a priest, this is not something that you want to be focusing on that much, uh, which makes clear mind better and then power onto others. I'm, in my opinion, just doesn't give enough cooldown reduction to make it worth it. As we come down to potency, uh, shattered perceptions, as you can see, I'm using at the moment. I think this is the superior choice for all 2v2 comps with the Holy Priest. Uh, and then you have a couple of options where you can pick either Resonant Words. This is very good if you're playing a slower paced or like style, I guess, or, or matchup where you're able to cast more heals. Um, and this is going to give you a lot of healing value over the course of a game. If you can weave a heal in every time you cast a Holy Word, uh, a Holy Word, a Holy Word this is going to be very valuable to you. Uh, a safer, I would say, healing boost is going to come from Focus Mending. And this is going to be essentially every time you cast a POM, that initial tick of POM is going to be increased by 53.2%, depending on the eye level, obviously. And this is 
you know, this is going to increase your healing no matter what. You should be pumping on cooldown. So this is essentially just a flat increase over the course of a game at no risk. You know, there's risk with this one that you don't cast the, the heals because of how the flow of a game might go. Whereas there's no risk with this one. This one's always going to be valuable. I would say Lasting Spirit is never really worth it. The extra two seconds on Guardian doesn't really help you that much. Usually by that point, you've got them topped or you've run out of Serenity's Poms, that sort of thing. Um... The extra healing on it is nice, but I don't think it's worth spending a conduit on due to the, you know, obviously one minute cooldown. This could, you know, could see, your conduit could see more value, for example, from focus mending. And then Holy Oration is going to be the sort of more balanced option where it's going to allow you to reset Chastise faster as well. So this is more offensive slash defensive. This one's offensive, and then I would say resonant words and mending are the defensive options. Um, and and over the course of the game, you might end up getting you know a few a few maybe ten extra seconds back towards a chastise because of this. It's not going to be some crazy amount, so don't expect miracles with it. But it's definitely something, and obviously it works towards serenity serenity as well. So it's a very balanced option. As a side note, I would say for 2v2, this is going to be a pretty solid setup for you. In 3v3, I would recommend going for Resonant Words with Focus Mending. So with regards to the talent tree, this is pretty much your staple talent setup. The main thing that you're going to be switching over here is Psychic Voice and Censure. And... The reasoning behind it is going to be essentially if you're playing in 2v2, for example, if you're playing with a DPS that has a stun, you're going to want to play with short fear. If they don't have a stun, you're going to want to play with the, the stun chastise. And this is going to allow you to set up the goes correctly, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But that's the general rule. The other options of talents to change is potentially Light of the Naru to Apotheosis. I prefer Apotheosis. I feel like it's more versatile. If, you know, you get into trouble and they have a lot of bursts and you feel like, you know, you're running out of serenities and you don't have a lot of healing available, you can pop this and really recover a lot of serenities fast. You know, it's not just the one serenity that you get from resetting it because for 20 seconds while it's up, all of your holy words are going to recover at 300% speed. So essentially, if you do like two flashes or heals or whatever, you're going to get a serenity almost out of it. And if you do four smites, you're going to get a, a chastise out of it. So make sure when you have this up that you're really coming out of it with two serenities available. You know, it's it's a very powerful tool for resetting serenity. And serenity overall is a very powerful tool. Now, Light of the Naru is more, I guess, for if you're playing a slower paced matchup, something that isn't as unpredictable. Something that isn't going to, you know, really force you to use all your serenities and feel like, oh no, I don't have any left, I need to reset. If you don't find yourself in those situations against this comp, then maybe Light of the Naru is going to provide you with more resets over the course of a game. Um, I feel like the fact that I can get, you know, maybe three or four serenities out of Apotheosis, plus an extra, you know, Chastise or two maybe if I get a lot of casts off, is so much value in a short time that... I would have to cast a lot over the course of a whole game to actually see that value from Light of the Nari. So this is the reason why I generally elect to play with Apotheosis over Light of the Nari. Now the last note for the talent tree, I would guess, is Enlightenment. Now the reason I don't take Enlightenment more is because in Arena you only have 1k MP5. Out of Arena you have 2k MP5, it's nerfed in Arena. And so this talent only actually gives you 100 MP5 in Arena as opposed to 200 outside of Arena. So that means that it's only worth half of what it's balanced at by Blizzard for the talent tree. So generally, I don't use it unless it's against a team that really has a lot of purge for my renews and I don't have much renew uptime due to uh, due to this obviously being really strong for my overall, overall healing. If it is getting purged, then maybe Enlightenment is the better choice. So with regards to PvP talents, this is generally what I run. Miracle Worker, Cardinal Mending, and 
Greater Fade. I would say Cardinal and Greater Fade are just really staple overall because of how good they are. Miracle Worker is very, very convenient because of how it allows you to play with Serenity and farming it back. However, there are some comps potentially where you'll want Holy Ward or maybe Ray of Hope. And we're going to talk about the Ray of Hope cheese shortly afterwards. Um, but generally, I prefer to stick with Miracle Worker and I would say pick these three talents until you're comfortable enough on Holy to make your own decision when you want Holy Ward. You'll know when that is. It's hard for me to actively tell you that. Now, the way that Cardinal Mending works, and I feel like a lot of people don't quite understand this or haven't, haven't figured it out yet. The way Cardinal Mending works is it's essentially a separate entity that you get in addition to your Prayer of Mending. That when you press Prayer of Mending on the target, they instantly get healed for 10% of their health. It, this ignores any sort of dampening, any sort of MS effects, just gives them 10% health. Now, this does not get included in the initial tick. The initial tick is separate, right? The initial actual POM that bounces around is completely separate from this. Um, and so that any scaling or conduits that you might have, increasing your prayer of mending healing doesn't increase this. This is a separate entity. Last thing I wanted to say, I guess Greater Fade, very strong talent. In case you don't know exactly what it, it, what it avoids, it avoids every attack, spell, CC, whatever except for interrupts. You can get interrupted through it. Everything else makes you immune to uh, until you cast an offensive spell. So be really careful with this. You can actually remove your own greater fade by accident by, you know, casting a chest eyes on someone or a fear on someone, anything like that. So keep it in mind. Uh, the Ray of Hope cheese. So the way that Ray of Hope works and, and generally you can, I haven't found that many comps where it's worth taking this as a defensive and sacrificing Miracle Worker, but Maybe there is, and I just haven't found them yet. Maybe you can find them for yourself. Um, but the way of Ray of Hope works is for the next six seconds, all damage and healing done to the target is delayed until Ray of Hope ends. All healing that is done, uh, that is delayed by Ray of Hope is increased by 50%. So what you can do is if somebody gets low and you really want a boost in your healing, you can pop this on them and then you heal into it. And then you obviously most likely will do more healing than damage. And they will come out on higher HP than they started. Now, the Ray of Hope cheese is abusing a mechanic with mind control, whereby when you mind control somebody, they you can cast one spell on them, one defensive spell on them, because they're considered friendly while they're mind controlled. So you can break the mind control with a friendly spell, spell on them, whether that be Power Word Shield, whether that be Guardian, whether that be Ray of Hope. Now, most of these spells that you can use on an enemy you wouldn't want to do, right? You don't get any benefit out of. However, with Ray of Hope, if you do this and the other healer doesn't notice, the enemy healer doesn't notice, they now have their very own Ray of Hope on a target. And if they don't heal into it and you spam all your cooldowns into it, they're not going to take damage for six seconds. So the other healer might not notice that they're getting chunked and might not use cooldowns accordingly, might not heal them accordingly. So then at the end of this six seconds, there's this huge damage stack on them which then is where we're seeing all these Ray of Hope one-shots come from. And so it's not it's not a bug with Ray of Hope as much as it's an age-old bug, which actually I think has been in the game since Classic WoW, where you can cast one spell on a mind control target. Um, so as long as you're aware that this can happen and you know mindful of if you see somebody get mind controlled by a Holy Priest, check their buffs. If they have this, that's what they're going for. Keep in mind, if they're trying to do the cheese, they're most likely going to be a lot weaker due to not having Miracle Worker. So if you if you survive the cheese, you can essentially just spam damage into them and the Holy Priest is really going to struggle to, you know, keep up with the single target pressure due to lack of Serenities. Okay, so as for comps. So in 2v2, right now I would say that Holy is going to be superior to Disc in every single... 2v2 comp that you can play. I can't see or haven't found a comp where I feel like Disc is stronger than Holy right now. Holy is just so versatile. You can play with basically anything and find strats to make it work. Uh, there are a few comps that I would recommend though, as I feel like they're more fun and just generally slightly stronger. And that would be Holy Hunter with any Hunter spec. Holy's, uh, Hunters are really strong right now uh, with the new Venthyr buff. Holy Feral, essentially you can do a go every time the Feral has a stun on someone and you can chastise Fear the other guy. You can also chastise a healer and allow your Feral to stun out of it while you Fear the DPS. 
and do goes on healer like this. So very versatile comp. Uh, and then you have Holy Asa uh, and Holy Sub Rogue. Now Holy Asa plays differently to Holy Sub Rogue, whereby the Asa generally will tunnel one guy down while you CC the other one with short fears with chest eyes. And you try and do this every kidney and people die. It's crazy damage right now. Uh, really, really easy comp for the Holy to play, I would say as well. You can also play with short stun into this, or as this, depending on if your Asa wants to AoE rot stuff or not. If he does, then you can play with with uh, with stun and longer fear. Now, with a sub rogue, uh, generally you want to be playing with short fear, and your sub rogue is going to stun lock the other target down while you, it's similar to Asa, while you you know you CC the healer or the DPS with chastise fear while your rogue goes ham on the other guy. And the reason it's good with a sub rogue is because the extra damage that you have as holy allows for really, really potent stun goes and burst uh, as a team. And so you can force out trinkets relatively easily and find win conditions with the comp uh, that maybe would be harder to force with disc. So it's a lot more forgiving and obviously you can go a lot more into dampening and have more goes in general. Uh, the last two comps I wanted to talk about is Holy Fire Mage and Holy Affliction Warlock. Now, Holy Fire Mage is all about combustgos and setting them up. And generally, you want to try and set them up with a CC on the guy you're doing it before, so they can't use any pre-CDs. And then you switch that CC over to the second guy and stun the first guy as the CC is getting switched over. And you can use Fear to assist with this. And... You essentially drop all the damage on them in the stun, uh, including the combust, and then spend the rest of the time in between stuns, uh, sorry, in between combusts, farming combust back. Now, important thing to note with this comp, don't waste your second fear if you're using fear to help set up, because it won't be back in time before their trinket. The goal is to do a second combust go before they have trinket back. If you're able to do this, then you're going to force extra cooldowns out or potentially kill because they can't get out of the stun, and you should be killing in the stun. Uh, the last comp I wanted to talk about is Holy Affliction Warlock. I think this comp is really, really fun for the Holy Priest. Uh, I feel like you're kind of the main guy that kills stuff in this comp. And essentially what happens is the Warlock will dot everything, do as much damage to everything as possible, pop his cooldowns sometimes to create pressure, and you run around stunning stuff and doing damage to stuff, because everyone's going to be going on the Warlock most likely. Uh, so you can spam as much damage as you want, pretty much. And you run around doing stun into mind games on the healer whenever the warlock's creating pressure. And this is going to force CDs out from the healer. Really fun comp. Due to the interaction between mind games and UA. Obviously, they need to dispel mind games to heal. They're taking a lot of damage from the warlock, but they can't dispel because of UA. So it's like checkmate almost. But yeah, really fun comp. Uh, I recommend giving it a try if you know a warlock and haven't given it a go yet. Um, but yeah, that's just honestly the more powerful and fun comps, I would say. Honestly, you can play with pretty much any DPS right now and, and get to 2.4 at least. It's 100% doable. Um, so yeah, if you've got a friend playing a, one, a spec that isn't one of these specs, don't not play because it's not on this list. Uh, because you can make it work for sure. Just play with the same mindset of CC1, stun 1, kill. Uh, in 3v3, there are a few, I guess, I guess Holy is opening up more doors with regards to comps that you would not usually see or be able to play as disc. Um, I think right now, a really strong comp is Asa, Rogue, Fire, Holy. I think we haven't seen as much of this comp as we could have yet. And I think it's going to be really strong when people start getting more proficient at it. Uh, we also have Fire. Mage with a Feral and Holy Priest, FMP. Um, again, really strong comp. I know that there are people playing on the US ladder to like 3.2k. So I would say this is definitely worth worth a, a second look. I think it's a very strong comp. And generally, any hybrid works relatively well with a Holy Priest at the moment because they smooth out the damage that the Holy Priest struggles to, uh, struggles to heal, the sustained damage. Uh, so with that logic, we've got things like Ellie Mage and Ret Warrior with a Holy Priest. Obviously, the, the off heals from those comps making the Holy Priest's life a lot easier. And Holy Priest generally 
making the goes stronger due to the cross CC available to it and the damage that it can do. Um, but yeah, as I said, any any caster cleave with an off healer, I think is going to be a solid pick. And any melee, any melee cleave with an off healer as well is not a bad shout. Uh, final notes, I guess generally things like jungle and sub RMP are at the moment stronger with a disc priest due to the way that these comps synergize and, and perform. Um, so disc is still in the meta in that regard. Uh, potentially there are some comps that you can play jungle and RMP with, with holy that, you know, it's, it's better into that comp, maybe something like a dot cleave. Uh, you're going to have a better time with holy due to being able to fade and dispel UA, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's it. That rounds it out for comps. Again, it, it's, it's very, very varied what you can play with holy as opposed to with disc where you're quite constrained. So just give things a try. If they work, keep going with it. So I want to do finish out with some tips for you guys for just like inside the arena and just how to kind of pilot a Holy Priest a little bit more proficiently. Some small things that you can, you know, know, I guess, to improve your gameplay. Because if you know them, then they're going to change the way that you're going to think about the game. Um, but generally, your healing priority should be to keep Renew on anyone that's taking damage. And remember that POM has a 25% chance of proccing Renew on someone. So try to POM first. And if the Renew proc procs, great. You don't have to put it up. Um, which brings me to the next thing, which is POM on cooldown. POM on cooldown. You have Cardinal Mending. It's insane value, especially if it gets multiple procs. Um... You know, you can proc Renew of it. Uh, it. It can bounce, you know, multiple times. If it bounces five times, I believe it's your most efficient spell. Um, so if it if it only bounces once, it's still really efficient due to Cardinal. So Bomb on cooldown, it's going to help you out night and day. Uh, use your Serenity, but not too much. So what I mean by that is obviously you have two stacks of it. Don't just hold the two stacks the whole game just because... They haven't used anything yet. If somebody's taking damage and you're going to have to cast, you know, heal, flash heal, whatever to heal it up, and you still have two stacks and they're starting to create pressure, it's okay to use a Serenity uh, because all your other spells are going to be working to farm that back and you're going to lose that value if you already have two stacks of Serenity and capped out. So keep that in mind, right? You're losing value if you're sitting on two stacks constantly. Um... Use heal if it's safe to do so. So what I mean by that is you can get away with holding something like a guardian if you're confident that you can use heal without getting stopped on it. So that's by that I mean like any sort of kicks or CC, right? And remember this heal is going to farm Serenity back as well, right? So you're going to get healing from the heal if you're playing with the... Um, the flash heal heal uh healing increase after holy word conduit i forget what it's called uh resonant words then you know that heal is going to do a lot of value on the first one after a after a holy word so if you can get away with it and you know the game pace or flow or whatever you want to call it is allowing you to get a heal off because you're in no rush to push for CC. You're in no rush to reset something, you know, Serenity or whatever. You, you know, you have time to cast a more efficient, safe heal. Go for a heal. Don't only go for instance the whole game, you know, is what, I, what I'm trying to, I guess, say there. Um, with regards to Cardinal Memory, remember it's not affected by MS. It's not affected by dampening. So if somebody gets sharpened, POM is a good button to press. Uh, don't Serenity into the Sharpen. Really trying to avoid doing that. It's really, really bad. If you if you waste a Serenity into Sharpen, you're most likely not going to get that much value out of it and still have to use another Serenity afterwards. If you don't have one, you're going to find yourself in that situation of, crap, I don't have any Serenities. What do I do now? This is the situation you want to try and avoid as Holy, and you're generally trying to play to avoid, which means obviously farming Serenities back early, Farming uh, Chastise back early, using Guardian when they use things, that sort of thing. Um, 
which brings me on to the next thing is try try to farm serenity back during times of low pressure which is what i was saying about heal if if there's a like a lull in the pace of the game because you're not using cds they're not using cds everyone's on dr everyone's just kind of pveing each other a little bit this is the time where you want to farm your your holy words back so serenity chastise whatever uh so using heal is going to be the most efficient way of doing that. You want to try and avoid using flash heal outside of procs. Uh, and also, don't use your flash heal procs if you have two serenities. Make sure you at least use one serenity first. You want to always be getting value out of those flash heals. Um, because the the large part, portion of the value, I guess, is you know the serenity farm back as opposed to the actual healing itself. Um, use Guardian as if you're using Iron Bark. So what I mean by that is Ironbark increases the healing that HOTS do, right, for Druids. Your Guardian is increasing your healing. You're not using it as a cheat death. If you use it as a cheat death, it's going to incur a three-minute cooldown as opposed to a one-minute cooldown. If you use it as as a as an Ironbark, then essentially you're going to be using it as late as possible when you're in a stun or CC or whatever, where you're confident that you're not going to die so that you have the highest amount of time out of the CC where you can heal into the Guardian. Because all that healing is going to be boosted and it may save you a Serenity. Um, it may save you, you know, having to play defensively. And it's going to allow you to switch from, you know, saving somebody, topping them back up again, going back to potentially doing your own go, or farming Serenities, Chastise, whatever, back faster again. So I've created this uh, healing efficiency table. And... This shows a few different things. We've got healing per second column here, healing per mana here, healing average here, uh, mana cost here, and cast time here. And this is the different spells. And what I mean by circle one is like circle healing one person effectively, sanctify healing one person effectively, circle healing two people effectively, that sort of thing. Um, and so I've considered instant casts to be a 1.5 second cast due to the global cooldown. Um, essentially, a, a, an instant spell is a 1.5 second cast where the cast is after the spell, right? You're not doing anything extra in that, that 1.5 seconds after. Um, whereas, you know, the flash heal, the cast time is before the, the healing lands. Uh, I've considered everything without haste. So Divine Hymn is 8 seconds. Heal is 2.5 seconds. And this is mostly to calculate the healing per second values which we can see over here. But the most important thing I think, and, and the most important information derived, I guess, from this table is the healing per mana values. And I'm not gonna go over everything in this, but I essentially consider everything below this line be other than maybe divine him to be something that I think is an efficient, uh, an, an efficient global use. Um, and obviously some are more efficient than others. We're gonna talk about that in a sec, but divine him obviously increases your healing done as well. So it has values beyond the actual healing itself. Now, circle is generally bad, not worth pressing on one or two people, unless it's like really an emergency. Even the healing per second of a circle on two people is worse than just pressing POM. So keep that in mind. Obviously, POM is with Cardinal always. Uh, circle on three people is pretty good. This is where it starts being worth it. Uh, it's, it's slightly worse mana than a Sanctify on two people. So if you are both somewhat low and you know you're feeling in trouble you're against a ua lock or something doing a sanctify on two players is worth it is what we learned from this and it's good healing per second as well keep in mind this is a serenity healing per second just over 10k and with a really good healing per mana of 8.1 this is only beaten by a five tick pom and this is again why like a one tick pom is really good a five tick pom is insane value so this is why you want to be tr trying to use POM on cooldown, just because of how much value it actually provides. And you know, this is really good healing per second global as well when it procs a lot. Uh, Sanctify 3 is actually our highest healing per second. If three people get full value from a Sanctify, this is going to be our biggest healing per second boost. So against a Dot Cleave or something, this is very, very nice. But yeah, if you look here at the Serenity, it's so efficient and so much healing per second. And this is why we're constantly working to farm them back because of how much uh, of a carry this this spell actually is to, to, the, to the spec. Um, we've got Renew and Heal, approximately the same healing per mana. Um, 
where a flash heal and shield are all the way down here, right? Flash heal and shield are approximately the same. If you have to flash heal to survive and you have a mortal strike, a shield is better. But this is only in giga emergencies, right? You don't really want to be pressing these unless you really have to. If you have a proc flash heal, it's fine. Um, if you really, really need to farm back serenities, for example, if a monk is popping cooldowns on you or something and you have apotheosis up, then flash heal is obviously the superior shout to try and get those serenities back ASAP. Um, but this is is very much an emergency heal to farm back serenity. Should be the mindset here. Anyway, I'm going to move on from this as I didn't want to spend too much time on it. I'm going to put the link to this in the description. So if you want to look at it more, you can. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what, an, a, what a go actually should consist of and look like uh, from your point of view. Because I feel like it gets talked about a lot and I just wanted, really wanted to like clear up what you should be doing. Because I feel like a lot of people don't actually know. Um, so we're going to start with 2v2. And there's two sort of conditions or situations or, or different types of go that you're going to be doing mostly in 2v2. And that's if you're playing with the stun uh, or if you're playing with the sap chastise. That's the two differences. Now, if you're playing with the, the short fear, which is the sap chastise, then a go is going to involve you chastising the off target, not the kill target, the off target. And you're going to try and do this at the same time as when your mate stuns the kill target. The reason you're going to try and do it at the same time is because if you leave a gap, for example, if they stun it and then you leave a second and then you chastise, then maybe if it's a healer that you're chastising, then the stun can get dispelled or they can pop a, a cooldown on them before you get your CC off and the go is essentially going to be rendered null. Now, if you do them at the same time, you leave very little room for them to react. So then you get your fear off the chastise because the other guy is stunned. He can't stop you. And then... The, the off target is sitting in like a 10 second odd CC chain thanks to you while your mate is hitting the guy in the stun. Once you've hit your fear, you can then go into mind games, holy fire, smiting on the kill target. And you're going to do a lot of damage this way because the other guy's in the fear, he can't stop you. So you can get as much damage off as you can in this way. Uh, if you are already near to the guy that you're CCing, you can actually get a mind games off in between chastising and fearing. So you can chastise, for example, let's say you're chastising the healer for simplicity. And you're CCing the healer. You can chastise the healer, run up to him during the global. Um, and then, you know, you're waiting to fear. If he trinkets, you can fear. He most likely won't. Uh, but you're ready to fear towards the end of that chastise now. You're going to have more than the cast time of mind games window where you're going to be waiting to do this fear. So you can mind games the DPS during this and he's most likely still going to be in the stun at this time. So you're 100% going to get it off. Then this leaves you more time after you fear to just throw in holy fire, smite, smite, smite and do as much damage. And essentially this way you're going to get as much damage off as you can. So this is roughly what your CC uh, or role is in a go when you're playing with the gouge chastise or the sap chastise. If you're playing with stun chastise, it's slightly different. Most likely you're playing with something like a hunter. Let's say, for example. And your hunter is going to be CCing usually the healer, but whoever, doesn't matter. And you're going to be stunning the other guy when your hunter lands his trap. Assuming he's not stun trapping. If he's stun trapping, you can do it when he stuns. Obviously, again, for the same reason as before, you don't want them to overlap any cooldowns. This way, your hunter is now able to DPS more freely into the stun. You can DPS freely into the stun. You don't have to fear immediately. You can save your fear and use your fear after the trap or whatever CC it is, depending on the comp, on the, the first guy, and continue to DPS the second guy. So your stun is more of a, or your chastise is more of a, more of the, the, the CC to lock the go target in place, if that makes sense. And this is very similar in 3v3. In 3v3, you're essentially going to be the guy that CCs the third guy. If you're playing with uh, Sap Chastise, this is. You're going to be that guy that stops the third guy from doing any cross CC or peeling or anything like that, cooldowns. And so you're going to chastise that guy when your mates CC the other two guys. Usually if you're playing something like an RMP, your mates are going to have one guy like DB Sheeping, say the healer, for example. Meanwhile, your rogue is going to be stunning the kill target 
which is going to be one of the DPS. I, I'm using RMP as an example, but this can work for most comps. Usually most comps have a stun and some guy that does CC to try to translate it. Um, and then you're going to be CCing that third guy that is not a kill target, that, that set, the, the other DPS, I guess, uh, with your chastise interfere and then doing damage during the, the remainder of the stun, similar to how you did in 2v2. Now, if you're playing with a stun, if no one else on your team has a stun, you'll be playing with the stun as holy. And your stun is going to be on the kill target. Uh, so your role is somewhat easier. You can go for the stun on the kill target, throw in a mind games and a holy fire, and then push towards the the either the healer or whatever who is in who is in a longer CC. Most likely it'll be a healer. And you can fear off to extend that CC. If the go happens to be on a healer, you can actually just run in straight away after your chastise um, and fear the DPS. Your chastise will be on the healer, so you have, you will have to push in already, because your you, your team's go revolves around killing things in the stun. If the, the 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 kill target does not get stunned, he's free to use cooldowns, heals that sort of thing, uh, and essentially again the the go is rendered null. And so that's kind of the long and short of how your goes are going to work as a holy priest. So I've got a few general tips that I wanted to go through. Um, this is more re with regards to cooldowns and damage. But press holy fire on someone pretty much on cooldown. It's even though you're not doing a go, it's going to be good value. You're going to force the other team to actually use um, more mana than you've used to cast it to heal it up. So it's it's pretty much always good value. The only time I would say is obviously save it is if you know that you're about to do a go, you don't want it to be on cooldown so that you can't use it for damage while you guys are doing a go. Uh, keep in mind that if you're playing Harmonious Legendary, obviously it's going to help you reset Chastise as well. So in general, it's a really good value, good value press. Uh, try to farm back Chastise with Smite during times of low pressure. This is similar, kind of, this is like a mirror to the farming back of Serenity with Heal. Uh, when there's not a lot going on, this is when you want to be farming things back. You don't want to be getting to the point where your team's like, okay, we're ready to go, and you check your chest size, and you're like, crap, I've got 20 second cooldown, you know, and you're not ready. And then you're like, oh, wait, guys, I need to do like four smites. This is this is where, what you want to try to avoid um, and is a large part of Holy Priest. So try to take advantage of low pressure times where you can uh, and smite something. It doesn't really matter what it is. The damage is not important. It's, you know, you can smite a pet. If it's safe behind a pillar, you know, it's it's just about getting the chastise back up. So don't greed too much on the damage. Generally, your damage done outside of a go and, and honestly, your team's damage outside of a go is not that important outside of really deep dampening. So don't prioritize it too much. Um, focus on just preparing for that next go and staying as healthy as possible uh, so that your team doesn't have to use cooldowns when they're not. And, you know, Avoiding using as much mana as possible um, by either kiting or, you know, whatever. Because the damage essentially does not matter in between the goes. It's the goes that are important. You need to force out those trinkets. Once the trinkets are gone, then you go for the kill. Uh, damage priority on the go should be mind games into holy fire into smite. We already talked about that. Uh, make sure you save your mind games for the go. Do not just use your mind games randomly throughout the game just because you want to do some good damn. It's really important to save the mind games for the go because mind games is insane damage for holy and you're going to obviously have that reverse effect as well, which is super good on healings, but it's also super good on DPS that heal themselves. So any any rets, Ellie shamans, enhanced shamans, you know, feral druids, anything like that, mind games is super strong on them if you get it off and the healer can't dispel it. So don't waste it. Uh, when you use fade, you can actually dispel UA without any penalty. So this is really valuable against something with both mind games and UA because you can sync up your fade with mind games. They're both the same cooldown. And so if he lands that mind games on you, you can just press fade and dispel them both and be completely safe. So if you don't waste your fade at a different time, he'll never get a mind games on you where you can't dispel it for free. Uh, against potentially other like rock cleaves that don't have mind games you can actually mine uh, a master spell and then cast fade right at the end of the master spell and the fade will let immune the ua damage and and silence as well and you can do this with uh shadow meld as well 
The last thing I wanted to talk about was healing under melee pressure. A lot of people have been asking about this. Um, and there's a few little different things I do to really keep myself safe. Um, I guess using Door of Shadows before I'm under pressure or mind games without, you know, you can fake the mind games right at the end, but essentially a lot of people like to kick mind games so you can use it to bait out kicks or mind control. Same thing with this. You don't always want to cast the mind control. You just want them to kick it. Generally, you can cancel it right at the end because you don't want to bug them out. Mind control bugs still exist in the game where they glitch out for your teammates after you mind control someone. Hopefully they fix it soon. Um, but yeah, I'd say Door of Shadows is my favorite with this regard. So they're all shadow spells and you can use it to bait out kicks on spells that you don't really want to cast. But if you do get them off, okay, it's not the, not the end of the world outside of mind games on a non-go where you don't really want to waste it. Um, and this frees you up to cast more heals and smites throughout the game. Um, and, and so if this is a time of, you know, somewhat lower pressure and you're not too worried about wasting that, you know, 1.5 seconds getting a cast or going for a cast that you know is going to get kicked. Um, and then you're going to have time afterwards to cast something like a heal uh, and be safe. This is a good opportunity for it because, you know, you're prepping yourself for when, you know, you know that they're going to do the next stun, the next go, the next cooldown pop, that sort of thing. So you're making sure you have those serenities ready. You have that chest eyes ready for your go, that sort of thing. Uh, and this is going to save you, save you from, you know, going for a fake cast and either not getting a kick or getting kicked on holy, which is infinitely worse than just doing a door of shadows and getting kicked on it and wasting a small amount of time. Uh, fade and feather stack. I don't think it's additively, but it's at least multiplicatively. There is definitely a speed increase when you have fade and feather up. You can use this to get away from a lot of melee. If you use the fade, either when you don't have a slow or when the slow is very low duration remaining, like two seconds remaining, because they can't reapply the slow. So you, you press fade and then you'd like press a pom or something on yourself right at the end of that slow. And then you feather yourself right as the slow falls off and you're going to zoom around the pillar and then you can proceed to pillar kite them and give them a really tough time getting back onto you and, you know, buy more time to get cooldowns back, to get serenities back, that sort of thing. So you're essentially extending the value of your fade by like a lot. Um, you know, the fade is going to be coming back up as well. And you can do this against warriors. I think this is really strong against warriors, especially when they avatar. A lot of warriors are really focusing on damage when they press avatar. And if you can avoid any sort of window of avatar, it's really good value for you. Um, and... Once you get away around the pillar, the warrior is going to be looking to leave. He's going to either try and door behind and charge to you, which is really, really telegraphed. You can see exactly what he's doing and go to the other side. Uh, be wary that he could also fake the door. So don't go straight into his loss when he tries to do it. Or he's going to try and leap and charge onto you. Again, if you stay on somewhat a corner, you can see during the leap which way he goes and run the other way and lost the charge if you're fast. So this is a really good way of avoiding warriors and, and forcing them to switch target and, and recover a lot of the pressure that they've created. Um, this potentially works also against something like ret. You can get away from ret very easily this way. Um, I would say the main two classes that you cannot get away from are demon hunters. The demon hunter is just obviously going to gonna zoom around the pillar and get straight back to you. Or monks. Monks have a lot of roles and that sort of thing to get back to you. Um, you can deal with monks in different ways. Though. Monks are a lot more killable and generally you should be fine outside of his image cooldowns. The Zuin is the big one and this is most likely where you're going to have to use Guardian and make sure you fade the fists. This is very important. The second go is, is large from them as well and as long as you have some serenities for it you should be okay. Obviously, trying to door away from fists if you don't have fade is a really good shout. Right as they start casting fists, you start casting door. They have to cancel the fists to kick the door. Otherwise, you door away from the fists, which is super good value for you. Um, again, try not to use all your serenities against monks if they don't have their cooldowns up. Because if you have no serenities up and then they pop their cooldowns, you're going to be in a really bad spot. So this is a really bad, really important matchup to manage your, your serenities against. Right, that's uh, that's all I got for you guys at the moment. If there's anything that you think I missed, please do let me know in the comments. I'm sure there are some tips and tricks uh, that some of you know that I haven't mentioned that you think would be worth sharing. So please do uh, do help us out in the comments. 
It would be much appreciated. I hope you at least found some useful stuff from this video. It took a while for me to put all the information together. So hopefully it is, it is in good shape. Um, thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure. And see you on the stream.